Hello everyone and welcome to another fascinating Bats in Churches live session. Today I should be joined by three really um, excellent speakers to talk about church roofs and um, one of our speakers is a little bit delayed so hopefully he'll be able to attend um, very shortly but we'll we'll crack on um, and Andrew and Joe will be able to talk to you and hopefully Sam will join us shortly. Um, first of all I'd like to give a very brief introduction to the Batson Churches project and today's live session. So my name is Rachel Arnold and I'm the Heritage Advisor for the Batson Churches project. Batson Churches is a heritage lottery funded project which aims to help churches, their communities and their bats live more harmoniously together. We work on a lot of practical solutions at our project churches um, which there are just over a hundred of but we also want to share the world of bats and churches with more people, which includes events like this series of Bats and Churches Live. And this session in particular has a little bit more of a practical aspect of feeling to it. Um, so it's really a part of our hope to build better relationships and understanding and often quite sort of disparate professions looking after both bats and churches. I can't remember <laughs> exactly how we fell upon the idea of talking about church roofs as a topic, but we certainly do get quite a lot of questions about them. So you don't have to look far to find a church that is looking for money to find um, to fund a church repair for a roof. It's, off, it's actually become quite a cliche. Um, and weatherproofing a roof is really the most important thing that you can do in a church to preserve it and its interiors from damage and save thousands of pounds in the long term. And roofs are often more than just a way of keeping out the rain. They are miracles of construction and carpentry with intricate carvings spanning vast spaces using ingenious solutions. So they're full of um, architectural and historical significance. And they're also home to our access points for bats, which are a species protected by law. And so this often um, impacts the way that we work on roof projects, but can also offer an opportunity for bat mitigation projects and bat boxes which we have been working on with the Bats and Churches project. Today I'm joined by Andrew Derrick from Architectural History Practice, Joe Ferguson from the Bat Conservation Trust, and hopefully Sam Wheeler will join us very shortly from Philip Pears Associates. And we'll be talking about church roofs, their historical interests and the ways that bats use them and what we need to be aware of when approaching um, building repair projects. I will just mention at this point that we discovered um, it's a huge topic for just an hour. So we won't be going into a lot of detail about the mitigation work that we have been doing, but we will definitely touch on it. And if there's some questions, we'll try and cover that toward the end. Um, and there was, there was also an earlier Bats and Churches live webinar that talked about mitigation work in particular. So do look that up on YouTube, it's on our YouTube channel. Each of our speakers will talk for about 10 minutes and then there will be a chance for a Q&A session at the end. So if you have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and I will also mention that our comms officer, Ioni, is waiting in the wings to help field some of the questions. So she might answer some of them as we go along. So without further ado, I will move on and um, uh, introduce our first speaker, Andrew Derrick. Andrew is a heritage consultant with many, many years experience working, uh, working with English heritage before he set up his own company, the Architectural History Practice. He's been involved with the Bats in Churches project for years now, working behind the scenes on statements of significance. And he, he always seems to remember every single church that he's been to, which is fab and seems surprisingly happy to talk about churches and bat poo with me um, on many, many phone calls. So, um, Andrew, over to you. Thank you, Rachel. So I hope you can all see the screen now properly. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. Um, seldom get poo introduced in my introductions, but um, I guess that's what uh, very much a relevant issue today. 
but I'm not going to be talking about bats in particular. Uh, as you can see from the heading, uh, it's the significance and sensitivity of roofs. So I'm just providing a very brief overview of why church roofs are important and, um, and their importance is not simply that of keeping the rain out, or indeed, dare I say, of providing habitats for bats, it, it, but they have supreme architectural, historical, cultural, um, artistic importance in many cases. Um, slide. So, so why are church roofs particularly uh, uh, timber roofs important? Uh, well, there are about 9,000 medieval churches in England, and um, most of them, sadly, unlike this example you can see on the screen, most of them have been stripped of their original colour and decoration. Um, and a lot of them have been stripped of their original furnishings. This is largely, as we all know, thanks to the sort of zeal of the Protestant reformers in the 16th and 17th centuries. So it's unusual to come across uh, a great deal of medieval carpentry and painting in medieval churches. <clears throat> but one place where we're quite more likely to find them than elsewhere is in the roof. Um, uh, church roofs are by their nature more inaccessible than the rest of the rest of the building and um, many parts uh, and in many cases the the carpentry and decoration within the roof is structural it's integral with the structure and so you couldn't really get at it very easily without causing serious damage um, so roofs often survive where uh, furnishings of the medieval period don't don't otherwise we're looking at the one example on the on the on the screen there, uh, a very well known one at Oldborough, sorry at Blytheborough, um, <clears throat> uh, with a lot of the original painted decoration and the angels. Uh, I don't know if you can see it there. Possibly in the wings at the bottom, there is evidence of um, attempts to shoot down the angels uh, with musket fire in the 17th century. They've still got the sort of pellet holes. In, in, in the in the outstretched wings, but um, <clears throat> but the, but but the roof survives and it's a remarkable survival in that case, not only for its carving but for its paintwork. Um, in his book on angel roofs, which I'll do a quick plug for here. Uh, Michael uh, in Suffolk, that is Michael Rimmer, estimated that nearly 170 uh, what he calls angel roofs survive in um, England and Wales, 170 of, of which about 70 are in Suffolk, Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. And I think it can be said that the roofs of our parish churches are amongst the finest repositories of medieval carving anywhere, not just in this country, but in Europe. Second book plug, uh, Alec Clifton Taylor, you may be familiar with him, um, English parish churches, as works of art, his book 30 or 40 years ago now. Uh, in that he wrote, in my estimation, the six best counties for parish churches are Somerset, Lincolnshire, Norfolk, Suffolk, Yorkshire, and Gloucestershire. You may not agree with that list. Uh, Somerset, Somerset, he said, was primarily for towers, others for their sheer architectural brilliance and wonderful richness of sculptural detail. But he noted that East Anglian churches um, surpass all others in the glory of their woodwork and especially their roofs. So I hope you'll forgive me if I, there's a slight East Anglian bias in this very brief presentation. So I'm not gonna go into great technical detail, but um, I thought I'd just show a quick slide, which is taken from H. Munro's Courtley's book on Suffolk churches, uh, showing the, the, the types of medieval roof that we we generally find. Uh, this, this is from a book on Suffolk churches, but obviously the roof types can be found uh, throughout the country to a greater or lesser extent. Um, 
I think in general, you, one can say that most medieval church roofs come into one of three broad types. There's the tie beam roof, the arch braced roof, or the hammer, bar, hammer beam roof. And sometimes uh, so, some roofs combine one or more of those characteristics. Um, tie beams are the simplest. Here we are still in Blythburgh uh, uh, with uh, the tie beam stretching across the span at intervals and resting upon the side walls. They're often slightly cambered or curved at the top. Um, it, as I say, this one's at Aubra. Here's one of our uh, that uh, church, uh, uh, one of our one of our churches for the project, All Saints at Weathering Set. It's high beam roof of similar date, this time with some vertical panels uh, um, above the tie beams, uh, open work panels. And here's another of our uh, project churches in Bedfordshire, um, where they're combined with some angels. So three good examples of a tie beam roof there. Here we see tie beams combined with arched braces, which are the these elements at the side, <coughs> um, in alternating bays. You've got the tie beams. That's in the magnificent church of Walpole St Peter, which is another of our uh, at churches. And here we are in Weatherden, uh, which also involved in the project, the hammer beam roof. And the hammer beams, are the, 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 so these, these, these projections here, and there's the hammer posts above. And often these were used for the uh, for the great sculptural detail. Here we have uh, a close up of the roof, a very well known roof at Corston in Norfolk, uh, the angel roof there. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, the works under the, the buildings under repair at the moment and allowing a close up photograph of, of, of the carvings up there. Much renewed in places, but also a great deal of original uh, carpentry there. And here's one of the most spectacular ones um, St. Windreda in March. Named, I think it's the only church dedicated to this rather obscure figure, St. Wendrida, Anglo-Saxon saint. And that's what's called a false hammer beam roof. And I think, and, and that means that the upper hammer beams, a false double hammer beam, and it's false because the, 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 the upper angels, hammers, are, are, aren't connected to posts above, going up to the rafters. So it's a nice quote from John Betcham in there uh, about St. Wendreda's. So we're back here in Blytheborough now, back in Suffolk, because <clears throat> roofs were not just a demonstration of the carpenter's skill, but also of the painter's. And we often forget, as I say, how bright and colourful our medieval churches were. There's plenty of evidence of former polychromy in our church roofs, and this is, of course, both precious and, and vulnerable. Here's Blytheborough again, and it, evidence of painted detail here at Corston again. Painted decoration was often particularly rich in the eastern bay of the nave, over the, over the rood screen, rood being the, the, the figure of Christ flanked by uh, Our Lady and St. John the Baptist, uh, St. John the Evangelist, um, uh, at, at the crossing usually. Um, this was often called the canopy of honor or the cilia. Um, here's an example um, at Lavenham, where you can see there's a slight enrichment of the, of the carpentry in those last two bays. By the chancel arch, this would have been over the root beam. And here's another example at Southwold, where the nave and chancel are undifferentiated. There's no chancel arch separating the nave from the chancel, but the chancel is richly painted, and the one and the bay at the closest to the chancel arch, the left, is um, 
even more particularly richly decorated and that would have been over the over the rood i would say so that's the canopy, canopy of honor <coughs> and these these examples of polychromy are, are not so common but 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 when they're found they're very precious and rare and they don't end in the middle ages here's a well-known example in in suffolk dating from 1859 to 66, painted by the vicar's wife, Mildred Holland, at Huntingfield. I think it's, you might call uh, Suffolk's answer to the Sistine Chapel ceiling, nearest we get to it. Um, so spectacular results there. Now, not all churches have anything like, uh, have roofs with anything like that degree of richness, of decoration and carpentry and, um, that's giving you just a small taste, but it, 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 I hope it's provided, provided a, 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 an overview, which gives you some idea of the richness and sensitivity of many of the ceilings that we're dealing with, ceilings and roofs. Um, and I think at that point, I'll probably stop. I probably have my allocated 10 minutes, but I'm very happy to take any further questions now or later. Thank you very that's, much. That's, that's, thank you so much, Andrew. That was really, um, really fascinating. I, nice to hear that there's um, a term for the ceiling above the chancel, which I've always just called the chancel ceiling. So I'll be using that in the future. That's really, really nice. Yes. Um, we did Only have when it's that particularly decorated in that way. Oh, okay. Okay. I must bear that in mind. We did have a, a specific question if you want, if you feel ready to tackle it now. Um, it's about roof bosses, um, the significance of roof bosses. Um, and perhaps uh, that... Well, bosses usually uh, appear at the intersection of vaulting and it's to cover the, cover the joint, the, the joint, if you like, or to mark the joint, whether it's a ribbed vault or, or a plain vault, but, but where, where the, the, the corners of, of the vaulting intersect, at where they join up at the apex, there's usually a carved boss. And it, that could be in stone or indeed in timber. <clears throat> it, it's, it's primarily, I suppose, decorative insofar as there's no structural need for it. And it was a great opportunity for the medieval carpenter or stone mason to show off his skills and uh, usually, um, uh, they had a greater free reign in the subject matter, so you'll often get some very unusual carving up on the bosses. Uh, green men, typically, is the one that people get very excited about, or, 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 or various monsters and so on. They could, they can give them greater liberty to, to 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 move away from the strict liturgical program that might have tried with the other decoration. Very nice, yeah. Um... Some of them are really, really fantastic, aren't they? And I think um, Norwich Cathedral has a huge collection of roof bosses. It does. I remember from my um, from my childhood. I, I'm from York, and um, after the fire at York Minster, there was a Blue Peter competition to design roof bosses, and that might be my earliest introduction to um, church architecture, <laughs> which is quite interesting. Did yours win? No, <laughs> no, unfortunately. Um, Okay, moving on now to a little bit more um, focus around uh, bats in particular. Um, Joe Ferguson is the built environment manager, is that right, for the Bat Conservation Trust. And she works a lot collating um, and developing research on building materials like breathable membranes and insulation, which feed into guidance that um, surrounds what we can use in historic building repair projects. Which ultimately ensures that um, bats remain protected. Um, jo is a wealth of knowledge and information and, and is always incredibly busy, but very quick to respond helpfully and positively to any, um, any church related question that I put to her. So she's, um, she's a brilliant asset to have. Um, so yes, yeah, so over to you, Jo. Thanks very much, Rachel. Lovely move this down um yeah so can everybody see that brilliant 
Right. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to be invited along today to outline um, via a few kind of key questions why our roof spaces are so important for our bats um, and how we can protect our bats while also preserving our roofs. So firstly, it's important to understand why we find bats in our roof spaces to begin with when this does bring them in close proximity to us. Sadly, it is the loss of natural roosting sites in the environment, such as veteran trees or um, undisturbed caves that has led bats to seek out suitable alternatives in built structures. Um, and these can be very porous, um, as the drawing shows, especially when you consider that bats can get into a gap uh, as big as an adult's thumb. Now, this is shown in modern buildings, um, and this is because bats want what we want really, somewhere safe, or somewhere clean, somewhere that's thermally stable, uh, to bring up their young and to, you know, to see out the winter in hibernation or, or torpor as it's known with bats. Um, so somewhere with a complete roof, not letting the wind um, and the rain in. Um, and their specific roosting requirements dictate the roosts that they use. So for example, in the summer, they're looking for somewhere hot um, and dry, but they've given birth to these, these furless babies. Um, any heat loss will essentially either go from the mother, and so she won't be able to pass that on um, in her milk that she feeds them on, um, and, or it might go in the young, and then they're, they're not gonna grow as quickly. So somewhere that keeps all that energy um, in uh, and, and lets them grow quickly, um, so somewhere nice and warm. Whereas in the winter, they're going to be looking for somewhere, um, somewhere cool, somewhere humid, um, that kind of constant temperature. Every time the temperature fluctuates in the winter and gets warmer, you're going to have bats waking up. Uh, and when they wake up, they're going to be burning energy, flying around looking for their food resources. And their food resources is insects. All of our bats are insectivorous. So obviously it's a huge issue in the winter if they come out of hibernation, there's no food. And obviously it's really cold for them. So they're losing, doubly losing that energy um, and sort of those fat reserves that they want to hold on to until spring, which they've been putting on in the autumn. So this is why we don't find bats in the same roosting spaces all year round. They're moving roosts for these perfect conditions and they might move uh, roosts within the year and also between years. So there's a lot of variation. Um, and using built structures, it does have that downside as I've, I've highlighted, although it provides all these great conditions, um, coming into contact with humans and therefore the potential for disturbance and harm is obviously a lot higher than in our natural environment. And we couple this with the losses in feeding and commuting habitat through things like intensive agriculture um, and rises in light pollution. And sadly, we've seen massive declines in our bat populations over the last century. Uh, and this is significant because bats are what are known as a bioindicator species. So where you have a healthy bat population, it indicates um, a, a really well-functioning ecosystem, essentially. And this isn't just for the plants and animals that are present, but also for ourselves. So I'm sure we can all appreciate after the last year just how important a healthy environment is for our physical and mental well-being. And access to nature has been shown to improve productivity in our workplace and schools, and even things like time recovering uh, in hospitals. So alongside considering their historic population losses, this is why bats are fully protected under the law from harm and disturbance. And also their roosts are fully protected, whether they're present at the time or not. Such is the key part each one plays in bats completing their life cycle. Now, all of our bat species are associated with built structures at some point in their life cycle, but for some uh, species, this association can be thought as building reliance. So we have species such as our common and soprano pipistrelle bats. They're only about four grams in size as an adult bat, um, and they like to utilize the external facade of our structures. They're sort of tucking themselves, hiding themselves away safely. And as you can see from this drawing, um, even a missing tile like that can provide them access. That's a, a south facing wall. It's a maternity roost of common pipistrelles, um, accessing that lovely, warm, safe environment for them to be able to have their young, but so easy to miss something like that. So they're frequently recorded um, you know, using built structures by specialists with specialist equipment, but they're hardly ever spotted by occupiers. You've got to be really lucky to spot something as small as that coming out of that gap, especially at dusk when the light levels are falling. Whereas something like our roof void dwellers, such as our brown long ears, we, we frequently get reports to our National Bat Helpline when property owners spot them hanging out at the roof apex. And that's kind of their preferred place to, to roost. 
and that's shown by the bats when they're present but also you can see a distinctive line of droppings within the roof space as well and that's a um, a roost that's been used for many many years and you can see that sort of repeat visiting in that that pattern of droppings so given that our roof structures contain multiple suitable features you know if they're getting in gaps as big as an adult thumb and I talked about buildings being porous um, huge huge variety of, of access points and places for them to actually roost um, we have 18 species in this country as well so and we obviously have that seasonal variation there's a huge range of places they could be roosting and equally there's a lot of potential for them to be impacted in their roost by building development or maintenance activities and so you can think of the, the type of impacts that um, they might come into contact or that, that might come from building works in kind of two blocks. Um, so there's that direct impacts, the things that probably quite quickly come to mind. So the physical removal of a roof or features within a roof, therefore removing the roof site, uh, blocking of access points through repair work. Um, we think about that hanging tile in one of my last slides, how easy it would be to put a replacement tile in that place um, and suddenly that, that, that access point is blocked. The bats might be blocked out, but equally they might be blocked in. Harm to the bats themselves, loss of the roosting site. Um, there's also, um, and uh, Rachel mentioned it at the start, uh, the addition of materials to a roosting site that might cause harm. So uh, modern roofing membranes is a really good example of this. The only um, sort of bat safe membrane at the moment that can be used in a bat roost is the traditional bitumen 1F felt. All of the membranes, the more modern membranes that are a long um, poly um, spun stranded construction have these really, really long uh, fibers in them and they can be teased loose by, by bats feet and bats can get entangled and, and actually um, they can die. So those are you know, incredibly dangerous. And at the moment without a, a membrane um, that's been shown by research to be safe, uh, none of the modern membranes can be used within a bat's roost. Uh, and then there's also things like pest control work. So very sadly, there's a really obvious um, harm in front of us there, a bat caught on a um, sticky fly paper, but also there might be things like um, chemicals used for timber treatment um, that may have residues within them uh, that, that might be toxic to bats. So those are kind of the, the, thought, the ones that spring to mind of direct harm and direct impacts, but you might also have um, indirect impacts as well. So even having people within the roof space, um, if they're not, even if they're not blocking access holes or removing materials, being within the roof space and causing a disturbance issue, uh, especially if you have mothers with babies, it might cause the, the mothers to actually abandon those babies to panic um, if they have people disturbing them within the roof space. Um, and things like lighting. So lighting within a roof space, um, you know, uh, can be very harmful, but also uh, at the emergence points. So uh, lighting and bright skies uh, for bats, uh, it's, it's sort of that fear of predation. And so what bats are waiting for is the lighting levels to drop enough that they feel safe to leave their roost. Um, and also you get that big upswell of insects just after dusk. So it, normally, naturally, it would be the perfect time for them to come out. But obviously the addition of lighting to a roost exit, um, it can delay their emergence time. Uh, it may even entomb them in the roost. Um, of, that's the worst case of harm and that we have, have bats die in large numbers being trapped in roosts by lighting. It may cause them to emerge later, which means that they miss that key feeding time. And you can see that um, in things like delay, delayed juvenile growth rates. So um, different types of, of harm, different types of impact, but can, you know, all lead to, to pretty severe um, results. So what can we do to protect our bats from harm, but also to avoid committing an offence? Now, I should be clear um, to say right now that I'm not saying any of the works that I've just highlighted cannot be carried out in bat roosts. They just can't be done when the bats are present or where the impact would last until bats return. So things like roost loss, the addition of those, those membranes, um, timber treatment. Uh, and so the first, you know, first port of call is an awareness um, of what to look for. So I've highlighted some of the features, um, you know, in the building that may allow bats access, that may allow them safe places to roost. Some of the features around buildings that, that may um, also um, uh, encourage bats to be using the area. So dark areas, you're saying that lighting is very 
dangerous and harmful? Well, the, the flip side is nice dark areas, nice vegetated areas. Um, we talked about them being insectivorous as well. So is the habitat for them to feed nearby? I always tell people to think about bed and breakfast. You know, again, that's what, what we want. They don't want to be commuting a long distance. They want somewhere nice to eat. They want somewhere nice to live. Have you got all of those in and around the building that you're dealing with? Um, and then the, you know, the next step is, you know, things like looking out for, for droppings. Um, if you happen to be in a roof space, um, I, I, on the other hand, am very used to, to talking about bat poo. If I don't talk about it, I feel like I've missed out in my talk, Andrew. So I'll, I'll do a little bit for you now. Um, yeah, um, they appear very much like mouse droppings, but the, the real test is if you've got a pair, okay, pair of gloves or uh, a tissue is that they crumble really easily between finger and thumb. So that's a really nice indicator that bats have been present, that you, you're, you know, you're dealing with a with a bat roost. However, as we've, you know, we've touched on, bats can fit into tiny gaps. They may be really easy to miss. There may only be a small number of bats. They may not be using the site very frequently and the signs can be very difficult and the bats themselves can be very difficult to spot without specialist training. So what we're saying really is getting the experts in, having a discussion with, with bat ecologists right at the start of any project before you're really thinking when you're starting to plan out works and having the specialists all sitting around the table together. The ecologists will bring where, you know, once they've done surveys, where the bats might be, um, how they might be using the structure, what species at what time of year. And then you can start thinking about how you plan around those impacts. And so the key is really, it's planning well ahead. It's having, um, you know, taking that seasonal variation into account and it's having that information at hand that everybody's read, everybody knows what's going on from the contractor on the ground to the project manager um, and things should be written clearly um, and everybody should be on the same page. And that's, you know, that's the really important thing. There's a lot of technical stuff that I talk about, but again, if I can't get this across or if your ecologist can't provide that to everybody in a way that everyone understands, again, that's where we have difficulties. So it's having those conversations with, with bat ecologists and specialists at the very start of any project. And so there's a bit of a whistle stop tour, as you can tell, multiple species, multiple uh, roosting opportunities, a lot of variety. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of information um, on what I've outlined today on our website. Uh, the Bat Conservation Trust website, in particular the building, planning and development web pages which I oversee. There are plenty of free resources to download um, and that's from leaflets on bats and buildings to our bat box information pack and then we've got more technical documents such as our lighting guidance note. Um, for people whose jobs might bring them into contact regularly with bats potentially, um, who want to understand their roles and responsibilities, we have a, a one day bat awareness training course. Uh, we're currently running that remotely over two afternoons and the next dates are the 13th and 17th of May. So I'd really encourage you if this, if you, if you, you sort of red flags today and you're thinking, yeah, this is the kind of thing I feel like I'd like to know more about, please do go to our website for more details or you can look on my Twitter account as well, which is at BattyFerg. Um, so yeah, I mean, really, I'm going to wrap up by saying ultimately our aim is not that bats are protected ahead of people or their homes or their places of worship. Uh, with good planning and early discussions between specialists, we see a pragmatic approach and that there are solutions that will work for everyone. And um, yeah, the Bats and Churches project is just a perfect example of this cross disciplinary working and getting specialists around the table um, and having these discussions. So um, yeah, thank you very much. If you've got any questions, please do pop them in the, in the chat feed, the Q&A feed. I'm happy to answer some questions now if that's useful or um, yeah, equally wait till the end. It's hard to know how long um, that was. So please do let me know. <laughs> thank you so much, Joe. That was, um, yeah, um, as you say, a whistle stop to a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. Information, really fabulous, but um, definitely picking up on the key aspect that we often take away with us, which is that that communication is just really, really the key to um to 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 working a way through. Um, we do have one yeah. quite specific question that um yeah I'll raise for you now, and it was: Do you have any advice or examples of handheld bat detectors that a first-time buyer could um? look at getting 
Uh, we have, um, I would encourage you to go to, we've got the National Bat Monitoring Programme, which is a citizen science programme, um, which is everything from going out of an evening and just seeing if you can see bats to learning to use um, bat detectors to, to full surveys. And there's a really good section on uh, bat detectors in there, which will take you through all the different kinds um, and give you an idea of how specialist you might want them to be. So yes, I'd, I'd encourage you to, um, yeah, to go to, to the web pages and have a look at those. And um, we can probably share those in there in the chat feed um, and yeah and encourage you to just get out and about we have a, a great survey called the sunset survey which is just going out and seeing if you see bats in your local area you don't need to id them you just need to you know sort of say that you've seen a bat in an area and you can record that with us but yeah if you'd like to get a bat detector we also have a lot of good um, online resources and courses to get you started and learning on them and then before you know it it's been 20 years and all you're doing is talking mm -hmm. about bats and there's nothing wrong with that at all <laughs> So um, yeah, and I'd just like to pick up on your point, Rachel, about communication. Um, as you can see, all of us have our specialist fields um, and there's a lot to learn in them, but sitting down around the table and being able to have that conversation, I'm not expecting anybody to be a bat expert off what I've um, discovered today, even after our training courses, but sometimes it's just learning to ask the right questions um, and to, to raise, raise the right questions with the right specialists. So um, yeah, this is a great, great forum today to start those discussions. Great. Yeah, that's fab. Thank you, Jo. And if you, and if you do have any of those um, links, that would be fab to share them. Yeah, I'll put those in the, in the chat feed now. Okay, um, I'm going to hand over to Sam Wheeler now. Hopefully you've had a bit of a chance to uh, take a breather. Zoom was not your friend today, was it? Um, <laughs> Sam is an accredited building surveyor um, in historic buildings conservation and has worked practically on a huge amount of building projects including churches which inevitably involves working with or around roosting bats. He's delivered talks on uh, roofing for the Society of the Protection of Ancient Buildings for their repair courses so we're definitely in good hands today and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about some specific examples I think so yeah over to you Sam. Thank you can you hear me okay? Good. So, um, afternoon. Um, yeah, as you say, I'm Sam Wien, I'm a building surveyor. We've worked with historic buildings for a number of years. Um, in this country, we, um, the aim today is to try and sort of cover how bats and repairs to um, churches can sort of live together, effectively, how bats can be considered when works are being undertaken. Um, we've got a fantastic um, range of churches in this country, as Andrew was showing earlier. Um, but many of them are of a, a significant age and um, with age comes sort of problems and uh, deterioration. As you can see in the, in the slide here, there's a valley gutter on a church roof in Somerset. Um, I think some of the dealing, um, detailing is not ideal, but the, there's numerous splits and patches and that roof is sort of running to the end of its life. So repairs and maintenance works are required on a regular basis. And when you come to work on these buildings, there are um, a number of items that are required. Um, many of them are, um, you know, there's well, all the things from materials you use, um, the historic nature of the building, um, faculty permissions, planning permissions, um, fundraising, um, all kinds of things come into it, specialist advice. And it's very easy to overlook the importance of bats and um, and other wildlife that use the buildings. So as a, a brief introduction, really sort of what I want to look at very quickly is how you know, the impact of that on building project, a very quick bit of the legislation and the ecological input and then some of the mitigation that we use. This is a Churches Conservation Trust um, church in Portland, um, a fantastic church, but it is one of the few that I've ever worked on that didn't have that in. So the vast majority of churches I've worked on do. I think here it's probably exposed on three or four sides to the ocean and um, probably too windy for bats, but um, most of them I've come across do. Um, it's good to know, I'm repeating from earlier, but all bats are protected in this country um, and there are several areas of, of um, legislation, probably the, the dull side of it, but uh, the important side. So you've got the Wildlife and Countryside Act, you've got the um, Conservation Habitats and Species and um, Countryside Act. Generally, the key points from that are that um, it's an offence under English law to, to kill or injure bats, to damage or destroy um, places where bats use, like roosts, 
and also to um, obstruct access to bats and their roofs. Um, so that they're the key things when you come to consider projects that we need to, to think about. Um, it's all roofs are protected um, and whether the bats are there or not. So you can't just say, oh, they're not there every winter, we can go in and do the work. Um, and it's an absolute offence. So um, you don't have to prove intent or recklessness. Um, and it comes with quite heavy fines and potential jail sentences. So um, something to be avoided if possible. So first of all, the fact survey, which Joe was talking about, um, needs to be in, in at a very early stage. And there's key things from my side of the surveyor that we need to identify. These include the presence of bats, which is fairly obvious, but if they're there, we need to know what types of bats and the numbers of them so we know what we're dealing with. And it's not unusual in church to have several different species using the building in different ways. And then the location of the bats and the roosts, including how they get to those roosts. So in here, another church in Somerset, function, we were looking at repairs to the tower. Um, there are bats in the, in the nave roof, which is to, to the back there behind the scaffolding. Um, and they come through the nave into the, um, into the ringing chamber. But having identified where the bats were and how they were using the roof um, and the various areas and how, and how they were using it, we were able to program the works for the winter when the bats weren't there. And we were able to protect in the belfry level to so put plastic sheeting and things across to stop things falling down. So actually, we ended up not disturbing the roost at all, but working around it so we didn't affect the bats or the roosts. Um, so the survey at an early point is essential. The other reason to bring in the, the ecology survey on is the survey um, really what you need in the summer months, there's what we call the emergent survey with the bat detectors that Joe talked about. And that's when you get most of the information on what types of bats are there and how they need to be built. Um, however, they can only be done in the summer months when the bats are active. And that's often sort of between May and September, so you have to program that in. And depending on what you find, you may need protective species licenses to um, to disturb bat roofs or work around them. And these again need, need surveys to be done and information to be prepared, followed by it's often several months to get the actual license itself. So it's something you've got to build in. But the bat reports also have a limited lifespan. They're valid for between 12 and 18 months. Um, and quite often so sort of you might need several before you can get on some. The survey then, like I say, to, to sort of highlight mitigation, and actually that can take time um, to, to set in place and get the works up and running. So, for example, quite often what happens is um, if it's a, a summer roost, it may be best to work on, on the site in the winter months. Um, and if you miss that sort of window, you may have to wait another year to start. So quite often you're pushed into doing work, especially in the historic building where you want to use lime and um, sort of other materials for the fabric in the months where you might not want to be on site. This is the, the Winchell Church we saw earlier, and as you can see from what the guys are wearing, it's not the nicest place to be in the middle of winter on top of the church tower. And then other things, but sort of protections and things, you are often pushed into doing work that you might not want to do at that time of year. But again, the, the involvement of the ecologist is, like, is sort of vital throughout. And then moving on, once you've um, you've got the roof sort of, you know, the timing sorted and the work's going, you've got to consider things like the access to the roost. You can't just hide it. And in one of Joe's slides, she showed us the tile. But when the roof's finished and retiled, in this case, reslated, um, it's nice and smooth. There's no holes. It keeps all the weather out. But it can also keep the bats out. So there are various options. Here we've used lead um, made by the roofers simple lead um, access points and the bats can crawl up in, but it also keeps the weather out. Um, this is a, an off the shelf one you can buy, but again, it provides access into the roof voids to the roosts um, that the bats can use. Um, so therefore we can keep the, the building up and running, we can keep the water out, protect the historic fabric, keep it in use, keep it running, but also help the bats and keep them in place where they want them. Oops, sorry, jumping there. Um, Again, here we had a, a slip flashing on, on a, an abutment on a church roof. This one's timber shingles, but um, doesn't really matter that much. But, uh, and then behind here, there was um, voids in the mason where the bats were, were roosting. And we were able just to form the lead in a way that provided an access for them. So we were able to maintain that bat roost and 
do the work we needed to do to the church roof without any problems. Um, at this one I just popped in, it's a, a stone tile roof, but the main point here was the, the breather membranes. And this is what one of the breather membranes that Joe mentioned um, um, wouldn't be suitable for a back roof and um, the bitch and roofing belts are the ones that would be could be used. There are a few that say they are back friendly until you leave the small print. So I don't think there are any at the moment that are um, that I would recommend or consider using if they were about to surround. One of the things we, we always try to provide some try to provide is some form of alternative um, arrangement for the bats, even in the winter if they're not supposed to be there. Um, the church we saw earlier, um, just in case there are any bats that we find in the ecologist's house, they can move to another area. Um, sometimes this allows us to work in certain areas at certain times, or it's just a safety device in case we come across bats that we weren't expecting. There are a number of types. Um, this one is a timber one, again, off the shelf. Um, different sort of forms for different bats and they're sort of readily available. And then, although this is actually a bird box um, for nesting birds, Sort of works on the church. Um, you can find the same and you can have a little bit of fun with some of these if uh, within certain parameters. So they don't always have to be off the shelf, off the shelf finishes. Um, improved mitigation comes sort of it comes from all points from um, sort of mitigation that is the is the, the term we use for um, the sort of the, the steps you have to take to try and protect the bats throughout. Um, so, you know, from the small back boxes, on this, this is Clee Valley, so we're not a church, the same principle would apply. Um, the bats were accessing very low on the, the left hand side through the ground level, flying right through this main part of the building we can see, and then actually roosting in the roofs that you can see up on the right hand side. Um, the, the, the roof itself is a fantastic medieval roof with some more paintings in. And we were trying to encourage the bats away from that area while we undertook the roofs, and you can see the new slate roof on top. And this was a simple, um, basically a simple box formed in the in the roof space up to the right here, um, it, with a little bit of insulation, so it improved the conditions and encouraged the bats to move from where we were working to where we wanted them to be. In other areas, we've had to sort of time works between phases of works. Um, so you do one part of the roof. Um, allowing bats to use the other part of the roof and then moving back to um, and swapping over at certain times. And generally those times have to fit around the bats. And the main, the main period we normally look at are, um, well, the ecologists sort of prefer us to look at are um, just as the bats are emerging, so it's sort of warm enough for them to, and there's enough food around for them to survive as they come out of hibernation, but before they got into the maternity roofs and they're young. And then you've got a similar window at the end when they're young and young enough to fly and leave the roost, but before they all go back into hibernation. So if you're having to sort of phase works, you often have to work between various time frames and those. Um, the two buildings we've got here, the other, this is a, a country house, but again, similar thing. Um, that's in the basement, a very important roost. And the sort of the extreme other end is they had a, a motor, a motor house, which was a former garage, used to look after the estate. Um, vehicles and this was partially rebuilt and completely formed in and this is now one sort of very flush flat house um, and the colony has been encouraged to move here um, there's not very many places where um, that, that's possible one other thing to consider is on both of these projects the major scaffold went up on both um, Cleve Abbey had a temporary roof but the bats access in both locations at very low level so the scaffolding and the protection had to be formed in a way that the bats could access through the through the protection and our scaffolding to get past the works into their roosts. So again, not always just the roosts that are causing problems. Sometimes it's getting to the roof, to the to the work, the scaffolding, the protections. Um, on churches, you often have to put sort of three, four meter high sheeting around the base of the scaffold to keep that out um, or to keep um, things out, um, and that sort of can interfere with bat access. So um, netting, temporary roof, all that kind of thing has to be considered. Um, on Cleave, we had to build in some bat access points through the temporary roof covering um, because we were there at certain times of the year. One area that's often slightly overlooked is that bats can live in, um, you get crevice dwelling bats that live in stonework and other small holes. So often here you've got a hole and some pointing on the church tower. 
and the bats were in behind using the voids um, as a roosting point. Um, so ideally what we wanted to do was repoint all the walls, repair all the stonework and keep the water out, keep the building fabric running. Um, so here where we have the voids, we had to um, have an ecologist, ecologist come in and check the voids um, with a borrowed scope. Um, and then they were either blocked and filled or we knew they were empty. And in some areas, we kept some of the voids. We made them so they could shed water, but could then also have a sort of void in up behind for the um, for the bats to use. And that's either sort of some of the eroded stones we've been able to take some of the bats out and then set them um, and almost make a little bat box in the wall um, to shed water, but also sort of keep the building running and also keep some of the environment for the, for the bats. So hopefully with them, um, Sort of very sort of whistle stop tour, I'm afraid, but with them, um, so those points in mind, we should be able to keep the buildings up and running and repair them successfully and not have too much of um, an impact on the church or the building or the roofs and um, all the bats themselves. But again, that, as Joe was saying, it's a team effort. You need the ecologists involved and you need to be planning and making time for the bats. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, that was great, really informative. Lots of different examples of, of things you've been doing. Interesting to hear about this, the scaffolding as well. Have you, do you find that you have to provide access through scaffolding or do you, you sort of have to think of ways around um, access? Um, for it? There's been a few, the two I showed, um, Trees Abbey, the main picture in that one was, um, we had a temporary roof with um, sheeting over. Um, and it came down the sides of the scaffold as well as over the roof. So we had to form um, basic bat access hatches in, in that sheeting so the bats could get through the scaffolding to the, the various roofs to be see. And on the, the house we showed there, um, the, the bats actually used part of the side of the house as a navigation tool to get to their, to get to their roofs. So we had to form part of the scaffolding. We wanted to form a um, an access tower and lift which stuck out from the scaffolding, but we had to put that on a on a different side than we'd originally intended um, because of this sort of access route for the bats. Um, but we also find um, normally it's not too bad because you can you can build in areas, but um, at low levels, some of the sheeting and things you have to do for mainly for sort of protection against thieves um, can cause problems as well. So. Uh, it's just all has to be considered and built in certain ways, but knowing that in advance is the, is the key. Yeah, it's quite amazing how they can still find the route through um, after you've provided, um, you know, that extra access within the scaffolding. Um, yeah, well, brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, we ha we've had a few questions. If people have more questions, keep, um, keep them coming in. Um, so one that we had, which I suppose it's for uh, Joe or Sam, I guess. Um, do you think that when a house or building is sold, that a bat survey should be a mandatory thing, like like an energy certificate would be? Oh, interesting. Mm. Um, <laughs> if if surveys have been done already then obviously we advise that all that information is passed over to the new homeowner so I should say that um, the start is that our national bat helpline is specifically set up to support homeowners um, who who may have bat roosts to provide free advice service as much as possible so I think one of the big issues is often that it could be seen as onerous um, and costly to have bats in your roof but um, you know a lot of the advice we provide we provide for free and we talk about ecological consultants and large scale works but a lot of the small scale works such as a minor repair to a roof which may block an access point for bats um, we can provide a lot of advice for free for homeowners so I think getting that that mess allaying people's fears um, about the potential burden of having bat roost and, and letting people know there's a lot of free advice out there whether it should be made mandatory for every house um, is a very good question I mean I always say that when you do surveys we're ruling bats out and not in you do have to assume for a lot of structures these days considering that um, you know they've removed a lot of their natural roosting sites that bats are likely to be present so um, I think as an awareness 
maybe ne not necessarily mandatory, but as an awareness exercise, it's something that would be good to have included in surveyors packs and things like that. Um, I've, I've done building survey courses where bats hasn't come up or protected species at all. And just an awareness that to have that conversation to come and seek advice from the right people. Um, I think that would be really important rather than necessarily making a full survey mandatory. I think I agree. I don't think it should be mandatory, but I think the sort of house purchase survey should include it on things like quinquennial surveys in churches. We, there's a, a wildlife section that includes bats and birds and so forth. Um, and I think probably the, the sort of surveys for purchases should should include um, that, sort of that kind of thing rather than a, a mandatory factor. I would add, uh, maybe on that point, rather than at the time of sale, if there is to be such a survey, it should be when building works are being undertaken, because it, it's quite common for, as Joe pointed out, for owners to be entirely unaware that bats might be living in, in their property. Yeah. Um, and the fact that the property changes hand in, hands in itself is of no consequence. But if major building works are being proposed, then maybe it is time to think about it. Yeah, I mean, for all major building works and even minor works, I would say seek advice at your first thought. You know, the, the last thing that you want to do, you know, we, you know, we have the legislation there to protect the bats. We're not desperately out to punish people. We think a lot of the time people are unaware, but as part of awareness and responsibility, you know, managing a property and being, you know, mindful of the, the, the creatures that might live there, just you know, on the first case, just seek advice. We've got a huge amount of resources on our website, uh, lots of free support for, for homeowners with bat roosts. And as we've talked about today, there are, there are always solutions to be found, but the earlier we have these conversations, the easier it is to find solutions and bring costs and delays down. So yeah, ask the questions, don't be frightened. I think people are afraid to look for them in case they find them. But what we've looked at today is you might well be finding them. So better you know what you're dealing with and then we can all help you and support you through that process. I think the, the cost and the delays is often a, something that um, the cost of surveys is something clients are not keen to do at the beginning of the project, but actually the costs to a project if you haven't, if you don't know what you're dealing with can be immense. Um, and luckily touch wood, I've not come across problems, but I have come across projects that have had to, you know, they've got scaffold up and everything in place, contractors on site, and they've come across bats and have to stop the trip. And everything once. has to stop, yeah. Um, yeah. And if you take the, the first picture I had with the scaffold um, up the tower, that was something in the region of sort of six, seven hundred pounds a week, um, additional higher cost. So if you have to wait two or three months um, you know, for a project for that, because you haven't done the survey first, then the cost can very, very quickly rack up. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is very, very true. Yeah, it's better to know ahead of <laughs> before problems occur um, what you're facing. Um, moving on to a slightly different topic um is it common we've well we've had two one one in advance about um um bells as well from jane but one now from joy as well is it common for bats to roost in bell towers um and are they affected by the noise or, or even the reverberations um you would have thought given the level of noise of some of the bells that it, it would be not the ideal place to roost however we do find bats using bell towers and I think that just gives you uh, kind of an insight into the fact that bats probably see the world a bit differently to us and the kind of noise that not that they don't experience disruption from from like low level noises but that potentially other noises or other levels of noise um, or vibration is more um, you know is more impactful to them but to be honest that you know again with a lot of bat research there's still a lot of work to be done we're only really we're, I talked a lot about light pollution the last few years we've collected a lot of information about that the next topic that seems to be coming along is is um, how does noise impact them and there's a lot of great research going on at the moment in relation to roads and noise and how that impacts them but we, we I think the answer is we don't really know we do find the bats there there is noise what what are the tolerance levels um, yeah we don't we don't really know is the <laughs> is the short answer <laughs> you regularly find them in bell bell trees and bell towers and actually we found them recently in um voids where the bell frame is actually built into the church wall and there are small voids around the masonry and they've, they've gone in in their nest right next to the bell 
I, I would add that um, we're all familiar with the term bats in the belfry. Um, so they surely do exist. And I've, see, I've seen the evidence with my own eyes. Uh, I've no idea what um, if the sound of bells has, what impact that has, but yeah. the, that they live in church towers is certainly true. And, uh, but of course, many, many bells, many towers have bells which are very seldom if ever rung. Mm. And it might be the lower end of the, you know, we're talking about low vibrations, low level sound. Now bats, they communicate in ultrasound when they're out and about in the environment, they can hear, you know, they, they also communicate in audible sound that we can hear, but it might be that sounds at that end of the spectrum, the ultrasounds are more impactful because they interrupt with how they communicate or how they find prey um, and they're more able to tolerate lower um, you know, sounds, there are certainly things like bat houses um, that were built in land around Heathrow. So you've got, you know, bat houses that are used under the flight paths of, of large aircraft. Very, but that's very, again, very low level sound. So um, whether it depends on, you know, the, the ultrasound or um, level um, component to sound, again, lots of research, as with a lot of bat stuff, a lot of, for every question answered, there's more, there's more questions out there and research to be done. Yeah, that's um, very true. There's so much to discover, especially from a, a creature you can only really look at at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are we're going slightly over, so um, I know a few of you, are, a few of our participants, will have to drop off because um, I expect you've got other things to do. But we've got we've had a few nice comments about the speakers, which is really good. And um, we, one from Andrea was um, for Andrew particularly. She found um, it uh, the bits about the church really is fascinating and wondered if you do any other talks um, virtually or otherwise. Well, until today, I was a, I was a virtual <laughs> Zoom virgin. Uh, <laughs> so the answer is no, but I dare say it's not the last. Excellent. Well, we can- um, well, Thank you for that positive <laughs> yeah. feedback. Thank you everybody and thank you so much for joining us and we've also had a bit about um, presentations so if, if all of our speakers are happy we will we can share the powerpoint slides um, with attendee and um, as I mentioned at the start this this session will be going onto our um, YouTube channel so it will be available to watch and anything that you've missed or anything that you need to look at again you'll be able to tune in there and watch again um, so yeah, I think that is all we have time for today. Unfortunately, it's been a really um, a really vibrant session, really whistle stopped her of everything that there is to know about church roofs. So it's been brilliant. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us. Um, it's brilliant. I've learned new things and I'm sure everybody else has too. Um, after the webinar finishes, there should be a link which will take you to a feedback page um, and we'd really appreciate it if you could just give us a couple of feed, um, answer the few very short questions. It's just um, multiple choice, I think, so it won't take long at all. It would really help us um, in our future delivery of similar events. Um, and thank you for joining us. It's, it's been a fab session. Thank you, Andrew, Joe and Sam. And um, goodbye for now, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.